Good morning, everyone. Wonderful to be here with you to uh, just celebrate God's goodness. Uh, it doesn't matter what, whether the wind blows and whether the, the snow is falling. Uh, it is a joy to be together. It's a joy to be God's people. Uh, and it has been, I think, so far edifying. It's been uh, a beautiful thing to think about as we approach God and, and as we approach the table, uh, what it means. What, what, are we, what are we talking about? What are we remembering when we think about the emblems that we just partook of? Uh, it's hard now because we don't use this table, do we, right? It, it is that you have to, you, you, we keep having to stretch our minds to make sure we remember the symbolism because we're not gathering around a table, even though we're going to be talking about the table today. And I was thinking, Jim, if there was ever a time where we should have moved communion to after the sermon, it probably would have been today, but uh, that's all right because you'll be, you'll have all these thoughts still next week, right? You, you can keep them with you uh, for, you know, more than just a few moments. So it's just good to be here. It is a wonderful thing to be God's people, to be uh, able to express our thoughts to him. Uh, at, at a moment this morning in class, Jim McCamey said, uh, you know, God deserves a lot of credit. And it, we, <laughs> Jim Ice and I looked, that's kind of an understatement, isn't it? <laughs> right? I mean, isn't that our whole purpose in coming here is uh, to make sure God gets some credit for what he's been doing. Uh, and so I'm glad that you're here giving God some credit, you know, and that's, that's the thing. That's, that's what our hearts want to express that back to him because we've realized it. We're not just blundering through imagining that we're getting, you know, our lives accomplished on our own efforts and our own power. We rely on him and he has blessed us over and over again. He should get some credit, you know, from us. So let's go to that father in prayer before we begin. Lord, we pray that you would teach us, help us to remember the profound things, the amazing things that began to happen as Jesus went into his last few days on earth before the crucifixion. And Father, we know that this story is about human beings, about people who are imperfect. And so we fit right in with them, knowing our own imperfections, our limitations, our weaknesses, our propensities, Father. And None of it matches up with your glory and your goodness or the beauty and, and the life that was your son's as he lived it here on earth. And so I pray, Father, that you would keep molding us, keep shaping us into the people you want us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why is this night different from all the other nights? Maybe that's a question you've never heard before. And I have never heard it because... In, in the way I'm about to describe, because I've never been to a Passover Seder. But it's a question always asked at the Passover for those who are looking back on what God has done. And the family has gathered, and it's usually a question asked by a child. Why is this night different from others? I mean, we have gotten rid of all of the leaven in the whole house. There's no yeast. There's nothing that can, you know, ferment. There's nothing. It's all been removed from the house. Uh, we're here, we're only going to eat lamb, and we're going to eat the bitter herbs and the unleavened bread. Why? Why are we doing this tonight? And that would have been similar questions that were asked even in Jesus' time, as they gathered around for what had to have been the central meal of, this, of the center part of the year. Uh, it's actually the beginning of their year, but it's, it's the spiritual focus of what God did for the people of Israel and what they're remembering in that Passover. And so tonight we're going to be, or today, <laughs> it is going to be a lot of night imagery, right? But today we're going to be looking at Jesus' last time he ate the Passover with his disciples. And in order to do that, we're going to have to go thousands of years before, about 1,500 years before Jesus' time, and take a look at what happened in the Exodus. So let's go there to begin, all right? This is seven days before the cross, but we're going to go way further than that, right? We're going to go many, many days before that. Back to Exodus chapter 12. Now this is God giving Moses instruction. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, 
when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat, in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Moses then relates this verbatim to the people, and the people then prepare to do this so that their households will be spared. And that image before, with the man you know, putting the blood on the doorposts and then the lintel, which is the, the post that goes above. Now, if it was me, I would cover it, right? It would, there would be no inch that wasn't covered or at least touched by blood because I want you to make sure you know I've heard the instructions, right? This was their way of saying, we are your people. And as you pass by, please pass over our household so that we will be spared. And you know that this was the culmination of all those plagues of Egypt. God sent Moses to Pharaoh saying, let my people go, let my people go and worship, let my people go from their slavery. And the plagues would come and Pharaoh would relent, but then the plagues would come again and they would change his mind and it was over and over and over. And this was the final plague. This was it. And at, at this moment, when the firstborn are struck, this is the final straw, and Pharaoh does let his people go, Moses' people go, and the Israelites leave Egypt. And so, as we look at this, this begins, of course, with the actual moment, the actual putting on of the blood, the, the, the night where I'm sure no parent slept because they were worried, they were concerned, they were hoping that they would be spared from what was about to happen. Of course, there was, there was weeping and great sadness all over Egypt. And even as God tells them what to do for that moment, he says, but look, this is just the beginning. You're going to remember this moment every single year. You're going to commemorate this. You're going to remember this. And so from this point forward, you have that Passover meal where you will sit down household by household. You see, some things that ancient Israel did, they did as a, a massive group, as a big body, uh, especially when you would take your sacrifices to the temple. You'd be going in droves. You'd be going, but the Passover was always celebrated around a table, and each household would be doing it individually. The Passover meal commemorated the Passover itself, the Passover event. And so when we come to the Thursday evening where Jesus is with his disciples, this is now Jesus' last Passover meal. And so that's the context here. It's, it's a, you know, centuries of context. It's centuries of layers of history. It is the, the people of Israel looking back on that moment where they put their faith in the one who said, you come with me, I'm going to lead you out from your slavery. You've cried out to me and I've heard you. And I'm about to do something incredible and terrible in Egypt. But I'm going to pass over you if you're following my instructions. And so Jesus now with his disciples is eating this with them. And I know we've read this a couple times, but for repetition's sake, we're going to do it again. When the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And I love how Lee highlighted that for us, saying, you know, think about yourselves. And as you gather around the table, do you earnestly desire this? And let's take this back to Jesus' life. You know, the apostles are going through this totally blind, but Jesus is not blind as to what's about to, to happen. I mean, he even mentions it here. You know, I, I've desired to eat this before I suffer. And, and they, they all scratch their heads. There he's saying it again. He's talking about suffering. I, is there an imminent threat? I mean, should we bar the door? What's going on here? But Jesus knows what's about to come. 
But he also knows this is going to be a happy time. This is going to be a time where we gather together, and I, man, I've been looking forward to this, because we'll come together as a family. We're a family unit, you and I, you, my disciples, and I. We're coming together, and we're going to eat this Passover meal before everything just sort of starts to fall apart. And so he has a couple of the disciples go and prepare this and get everything ready, and then comes to here, verse 16, for I tell you that I will not eat it until it was fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Now, having you know, reminded ourselves of the immense context with every Passover Seder, here they've gathered together, and they're about to eat this meal. And what does Jesus say? This is about me. This is about me. This that we drink, you know, this, this fruit of the vine, this represents my blood that I'm about to pour out for many. This bread is my body. Do you notice he doesn't mention the lamb that's on the table? He doesn't mention it. Why? Because he's the lamb. John the Baptist has already said, he's pointed to the disciples. The first thing he says about Jesus, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus knows, well, that's, that's me, right? And they're going to understand it eventually, but right now they can't get it. So right here in this moment where Jesus sits down around the table with his disciples, the Passover is transformed in their minds. Or it will be once they put it all together, once they understand it. Because the blood that was put on the doorpost and over the lintel, well now this is going to be the blood that is spilled from my wrists and from my feet and from my side. I'm about to go to the cross. And it's not going to be an, an animal like a lamb that is just you know, told to go where it's supposed to go. I'm I'm taking up my cross. I'm taking up the will of my Father in this case, and I'm going to do what he has called me to do. I go there willingly, and I know what it is that is at stake. The lamb was there, and the blood was on the doorpost so that the family might be saved. And Jesus says, but the salvation I'm going to offer extends well beyond just the people of Israel and just that one time. I'm going to save everybody. I'm going to save the entire world. The teen class that we just started on Wednesday night is going to be talking about God and the world and what it means when you know, God looks down and he loves the world. You know, he, he doesn't love the, the rottenness of the world. You know, God doesn't love sin. He doesn't love that aspect of the world. But God loves every human being that he's fashioned and he wants them in his kingdom. And so Jesus says, well, I need to step up into this role as the final, the ultimate Passover lamb. He's the final one. And once Jesus offers his life, the way the church begins to look at it is, it was actually the Passover that was foreshadowing something even greater. See that transformation? See that twist? Uh, whereas they saw that that was, the, that was the defining moment for our people. The Christians now say, this is the defining moment. That was only pointing us ahead to what was about to come with God's wrath taken away. Now walking in the presence of God and fellowship with God. In communion with God. As 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says and describes about this table. So... Jesus transforms the Passover. And like he does so many times, he boldly says, this is all about me, right? I mean, if there were Pharisees around, they would have been aghast again, right? If they had heard his words about the Passover, what do you mean, you know, this is your body broken for many? What are you, what are you talking about? It is. And it always has been, but, but now you'll see. This is, this is going to be about my death rather than about the slain lambs that you brought to Jerusalem. 
So this is now becomes a new meal as a new memorial. Because we're going to be you know, moving into the church now, we're now living in this new covenant, and this is now the new time where we stop and we ask, why is this time around the table different from all the other times? It's almost every week we say that. You know, this table is different. It's a new memorial. Paul sees it that way. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So Paul sees this. I mean, Paul is steeped in the meaning behind the various feasts and meals of the, of the Jewish religion, of the Jewish faith that he was a student of. And now he says, but, but now I see it. Things have been changed and transformed, and now there's a new memorial feast. And every time we gather, we are proclaiming the death of the Lord until he comes back again. So all of this is happening at that moment as he gathers with his disciples around the table. And uh, let's, let's begin. Let's take a look at what this then means for us. We've already started to go down that road a little bit. But here's the first point I want to make because it has to be made. Because as you're reading the Gospels, you come across this moment and you say, well, you know what? It doesn't seem like a very happy meal, actually, Mike. When I look at the events that happen there, and that's exactly right. Even beautiful moments can get spoiled because there's human beings involved. What do I mean? Well, let's take, for example, the fact that Judas is exposed as a betrayer. It either happens at the beginning of the meal or in the midst of the meal. They're, they're doing the dipping and they're doing various things. But it seems that Judas is there for at least part of the meal. And uh, Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. I can't imagine he was looking forward to that part of the meal. Okay, But that's part of it. That's part of this whole scene as we remember what happened at the Last Supper. Uh, also, Peter's denial is foretold, and he denies it. I, I love that, right? I mean, you're, you're going to deny me three times before the rising of the sun. No, I would never do that, right? Uh, he's already beginning to get into his denial phase. And that's remembered in all four Gospels. Poor Peter, it's remembered four different times that Jesus said, you would do this, Peter. Peter has to finally say, well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of my story, is what happened there that night. And to top it all off, and maybe to start it all off, we're not sure the order of some of this, uh, the apostles have an argument, okay? What would they argue about? Well, here's the thing. When you have a great feast, a great meal like the Passover Seder, the first question that has to be decided is who's going to sit where? And I have to imagine that came up. I mean, I've never held a party that was, you know, highfalutin enough to worry about the question of who's going to sit where and who's going to have the prominent spot. Uh, I, I mean, something happens in weddings sometimes, but the rest, you know, I, I don't know. I, you'd almost never have a meal like that. Well, I think it came up because there were prominent spots and there were lesser spots around the table. This is what Luke uh, describes for us. Uh, this is in uh, Luke 22. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. <sighs> right? Don't you just have to sigh audibly? Are you kidding me? Do you know what Jesus is up against? No, they don't know. So give them a break, all right? They're just, they're just mad about the placards, you know, the name cards and who's sitting where, all right? And he said to them, Jesus, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table, but I am among you as the one who serves? I was reading one commentator, and I think he hit it. On, right on the head. When Jesus says this, you know what I think he does next? I think he does what John describes. 
gets up from the table, takes off his outer garment, and begins to serve. Because Jesus showed them a demonstration of love and service and called them to do that instead of the bickering. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from, the, from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. I think it fits perfectly. They start having a, a you know, argument well who's sitting where you know who's who's really the most important around here and and jesus says all right that's it i gotta show you guys I, i i've been saying it and saying it and saying it i just need to show you what it means to be poor in spirit what it means to be somebody who's come to serve rather than to be served i'm gonna wash your feet the lowest slave in the household was given this task because it's nasty it's gross right it's not the way you want to start your dinner by washing everybody else's feet, but that's Jesus. He gets down there and washes their dust-covered feet. When he had finished, of course, he gives them this lesson. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, back to the table, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Now, what do I think this does not mean? I think this does not mean we set up some kind of, you know, a service where we have to officially wash feet each time that... Uh, I, I don't know, what, once a year, however, I, I, and get really legalistic about it. Um, this happens in some churches. They do foot washings. And guess what? Everybody shows up with the cleanest feet you can imagine. <laughs> Trust me, I know. I know family members who have done this, right? Uh, it's, it's totally, you know, you, he doesn't just mean this exact thing, do as I have told you to do. It's just like the Lord's Prayer. It doesn't have to be these exact words. I'm showing you how to pray. I'm giving you a formula. I'm giving you a way to live with each other. And what a distinction it would have been. The one who was at the honor, most honored position is the one who gets up from the table and lowers and humbles himself. He says, do this among each other. If we only could do that, right? If we could only live that way, how the church would be different, how our families would be different. We're called upon in Ephesians chapter 5 to submit to one another. That's like the overarching way we should be among each other. Submitting. What, what, what do you want? How can I serve you? How can I help you? That's my first impulse. How can I lift you up? Even if it humbles me, that's all right. I can't get lower than Jesus in this moment, right? Jesus is the one who served all. So in this moment, you have the chaos of the, the, the betrayer and then the denial. By the way, the prediction of Peter's denial comes with Jesus saying, you're all going to desert me. And it's Peter who says, no, you know I won't do that. Jesus says, of course you will. And, but it also says, and all the others agreed with him. All the others said, yeah, we won't do that. You're right, Lord. We're not going to. Or, or, no, you're wrong, Lord. We're, 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 dead. we're not going to desert you. And Jesus knows by the end of this night, they all will desert him. And so this moment was spoiled, but Jesus gives them the contrasting way of living. Jesus loved and served, and we get to do the same. Going forward, when we gather around the table, what is it that we're doing? When we take of the cup and when we take of the bread, well, we're doing primarily three things in this new memorial feast that he's given us. We are first commemorating what happened. We have to commemorate because we tend to forget. Uh, Jesus in Luke says, do this in remembrance of me. Paul says, do it in remembrance of him. Keep him in your memories. We need reminders. We need fresh ways of coming back and looking at stories that we know and we're so familiar with. We are a people, at least Americans, are so into memorials. I mean, we have so many memorials. 
the closest national battlefield, it's not really a park, but the closest national battlefield to where I'm standing right now is a memorial to a battle that happened, uh, and it's called Fort Necessity. All right? So you could go there, and this is what it looks like. And if you've never been, I recommend it. It's beautiful. It's a great place. They've done a great job. They've, they tell the story of what happened there. But do you want me to sum up for you what happened at Fort Necessity? Okay, I'm just going to sum it up for you. Uh, a hopeless battle fought from a foolish location, ending in George Washington's surrender to the French. Right? This is pre-revolution. You know, this is the French and Indian War, as we call it, right? Uh, this is George Washington making error after error. Uh, he's a lieutenant colonel at this point. And I guarantee you, we would not remember this place and have a memorial here if it wasn't George Washington himself, right? Because yeah, everywhere he stepped, we have to stop and say he stepped here, right? And, or and in some cases, he slept here. George Washington slept upstairs, and so we preserve uh, this building. But we, we preserve all kinds of things because we're worried that we're going to forget for good reason. We've got to commemorate things that are worthy of remembering. So the first is to commemorate, but the second is to anticipate. What we take here, we're, we're taking as a way of looking forward, not just backward. And that was true of the Passover as well. Uh, you know, when they, when they took the Passover, it was, remember, with the, with the belt on, sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, out the door, because it's about time to go. It's about time to leave Egypt. Unleavened bread. You don't have time to wait for that bread to rise. So forget the yeast. Set it aside. You know, we've got to you know, do what we can do. We've got to get out the door. And our feast, the Lord's table, also anticipates the future. Uh, as Paul says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. There will be a time when we're, we're not gathered around the table anymore because he'll come back to gather us home. And I believe that's part of what he's saying when he says that I'm not going to partake of this until it's fulfilled in the kingdom. I think to some degree, he's looking forward to that day when he's going to bring us home. But the Passover meal, that was, that was almost like an MRE, right? Um, the army loves MREs, and, and they love their acronyms. And this is an easy one, meal ready to eat. You got to keep it simple for army guys, right? Here's your MRE. What's an MRE? Meal ready to eat, buddy. So it's ready for you. Whenever you get hungry, we're going to you know, stop and eat this. And I personally like them. I, I think they're great. You can get them. You can pick them up at, uh, you know, the thrift or what do you call those? The Army, Navy surplus store. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, and you can buy them, the ones that were made back in 1940, because there's, they can last for centuries, apparently. And, <laughs> They're just fine. You cut them open. And the newer ones, you don't have to use it. It's, it's flameless warming, all right? So there's a little pouch, and you just add water. Uh, I don't know the science behind it, but it works. It heats it all up. It tastes so yummy and great. Most of them do. I mean, I guess there's some are better than others. But it's better than, for example, what they ate during the Civil War, which was hardtack. One word, hardtack. And I, I, this is a little bit off subject, all right, off topic. But I found this paragraph, which is hilarious. Hardtack was hard as a rock, like rock hard. Don't think that's a tasty little cracker, you know, that you can like that you get from Nabisco or something. No, no, no. This was solid rock. But look at this paragraph. Hardtack had a propensity for harboring insects. Oh, fun fact. For this reason, soldiers referred to the crackers as worm castles. Doesn't that sound great? Though jokes were made about the extra protein that the insects provided, soldiers often dunked the crackers in hot coffee to drive out the bugs. Hot liquid will also soften the often stale hardtack, making it easier to eat. As I said, I, I digress there, but I had to include that amazing fact. The bottom line is, this is supposed to be temporary food. Like this is the food you grab and we're off and gone. We're on our way, we're out the door. Uh, maybe for you, it's, you know, just some trail mix or something. I don't know. Just grab it and go. The, the thought being, the meal's not necessarily the important part here. The important part is we're on the move. 
Uh, when, when soldiers eat the trail rations, they're on the move. There's something else bigger going on, and, and food is just a necessity so you can go to the next thing. That's how we should think about the table. It's what we're eating on the way. We are not making our home here. We're not even barely camped here. We're moving on. We're sojourning through this life with something greater that we're anticipating on the way. And finally, as Paul describes it, this is a time to evaluate. Uh, I try to help people. You know, the two main things we talk about as far as coming into and being in the kingdom is baptism and the partaking of the Lord's Supper. We hold those two up as you know, the, the fundamentals, you know, two solid columns that are holding up you know, what we do here as a body. And before somebody's baptized, we expect them to evaluate their lives and you know, come to God in repentance and you know, before they're lowered into that water. And the same, Paul says, is true for partaking of the Lord's Supper. It's a time to stop, evaluate, take a moment and think about your life. The thing with baptism is that's a one-time thing, and this gives us an opportunity to evaluate every week, take a time to think about our lives before God. Uh, again, Paul in 1 Corinthians, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. It's a time, a God-given time, a blessing, really, if you think about it, to stop and think, evaluate. Remember what has been done for you, Mike. Don't let that pass you by in the hustle and bustle, even in the hustle and bustle of how this church is, you know, the church is on the move and we're anticipating. But for a moment, stop and think, evaluate. Where is your life right now? What was this past week like? And it may be time to come back humbly before God. To realize that I, again, need that blood over my doorpost. Because I don't want to be wrong with God. I don't want to be, I want to be right with God. I, I don't want things to be off between me and him. I want to be confident. I want to be able to know that the God who cared enough to send Jesus is pleased with my life. And that's what Paul's point is here. Take that time each time we partake of this table. And so that is for us. What we draw then from this one moment with Jesus around the table with his disciples. We are a people who are always continually falling back on God's grace. We need to be forgiven for the times when we spoil what could be good things. We're often fumbling the good things in our lives. Jesus came as an example of love and service. He said, let me show you, let me demonstrate that in a very vivid, visual way. And we get to do the same. We get to love people, humbling ourselves, exalting others so that we can live the way Jesus did. And then, of course, when we gather around the table, we commemorate, we anticipate, we evaluate as we participate, commune with the one who wants life to be good between us and him. And one day, he's going to gather us together with him. Maybe this morning you need to make that relationship with him right and maybe for the first time uh, and so that each week then you would still be thinking about and, and, and evaluating you know that life with him but it begins with coming into contact with the blood of jesus christ that was shed for you to die to have your old life die in baptism which is what is described in romans chapter 6 where we die and then we are raised to new life again so if you need to take him up on that offer, maybe you need to be baptized into Christ today. Or maybe you look at your life and you say, I am in desperate need of help. And I need God's grace. I need God's forgiveness, especially at this moment. And so we're here for that as well. In either case, come as we stand and sing.